Instead of running just half a step forward. Barbara, Barbara. I slightly to your left. That's it, hands. Lovely, lovely, lovely. In August 1958, a low-budget movie about national service was about to spawn a series of 30 films and make household names of its stars. That's it. Straight this way, Barbara. And to the middle, Barbara. One of them, Barbara Windsor, recently helped launch a set of stamps to commemorate this year's 50th anniversary. I feel very honoured. It's a British institution, isn't it, the carry-ons? I suppose I think there's a day that a carry-on's not on somewhere in the world. Young and old alike have watched the films, including the new generation of military men from the Household Cavalry Mounted Regiment, chosen to pose with her. Having seen them, the Carry On movies, taking part in this, it's great. It's just awesome being here and seeing Barbara Windsor. And the fact that the very first one was Carry On Sergeant, <laughs> what about that? It's quite ironic, isn't it? I mean, my parents were brought up on Carry On films. They were fun. It's certainly a very puzzling case, Doctor. It's an enigma. That's what it is, Matron, an enigma. I am not having another one of those. They were a little bit naughty. Vic, darling, I think I'd like a roll. Great. Let's go upstairs. I mean a sausage roll. Oh. <laughs> but at the same time, they provided a picture of Britain. And that picture in Carry On Sergeants barely recognisable from that shown in Carry On Emmanuel 20 years later. In 1958, society was about to undergo a period of extraordinary change. The end of the post-war age of deference, the growth of the NHS, industrial strife, the birth of package holidays and, of course, the sexual revolution. There was one constant over that period, the carry-on films. And over the next hour, I'm going to delve into some of them to see how they reflect our nation in flux. I'm humbled to think that we did represent Britain. Norman Houdis, who wrote the first six, had no serious ambition for them other than as easy entertainment in the music hall tradition. We didn't know we were being significant either in any degree or that we were reflecting any social or political mores of any kind. We just followed our little noses and it led us to fame and fortune, which was nice. Derided by critics during their 20-year span, it's only relatively recently that social commentators have come to appreciate them. They weren't films that set out to have an explicit social message, but in a paradoxical kind of way, that gives them more meaning. Andy Medhurst features the Carry On films as he lectures on media, film and cultural studies at Sussex University. For him, they capture the way that people living humdrum lives with limited horizons found a release in comedy. They weren't trying to be propagandistic in any kind of way. They weren't trying to say this is how life should be. They do seem to encapsulate a kind of everyday life of Britain over that period of time. The Carry On team, Kenneth Williams, Charles Hawtrey, Hattie Jakes, Kenneth Connor, Sid James, Joan Sims and of course Barbara Windsor are forever associated with seaside postcard humour. How about those two things sticking out in front? Yes, how about them? <laughs> oh, so <saucy>. <laughs> Over time, the films got bawdier, the double entendre is riskier, but back in 1958, when Carry On Sergeant came out, Britain was still in a period of relative austerity and regimentation. I'm choosing the plot line of Charlie Sage, played by Bob Monkhouse, whose wedding night plans are thwarted by his National Service call-up, the carry-ons were born. The wartime experience of different classes thrown together provided ripe material for producer Peter Rogers and director Gerald Thomas, the team behind the whole series. The leading film historian Sir Christopher Frayling, who's rector of the Royal College of Art, was 12 when Carry On Sergeant came out in 1958. There is the historic moment at the beginning where Kenneth Connor is on the train with Bob Monkhouse and you get the first suggestive joke in the history of Carry On where Connor plays a hypochondriac and Monkhouse said, how did you pass the medical? And Connor says, army doctors. <laughs> I'll tell you, mate, two of everything you should have, two of and you're in. And I remember giggling, thinking, that that's the sort of thing you say behind your hand at school, I was at a boarding school, needless to say. That was the, the sort of snigger-snigger kind of joke. So it was on the edge of risque. I've subsequently discovered that Carry On Sergeant got into trouble with the censor. The censor's report has now been published, and it's quite interesting what they were worried about. The beginning of the report says 
this is a good-hearted sort of comedy, so we're not going to be so tough on it as we might have been. But two lines worried them. One was, in reference to bureaucracy, someone says, you're all a load of chits. And the other was, someone says, man cannot live by sausage rolls alone, which you think, is that worrying? It's because it was a reference to the Bible. Man cannot live by bread alone. And the censor wrote and said, I really think that's too close for comfort if you're actually going to quote a line which depends on its humour on recognising it. From the... Interesting. I mean, that's 1958 for you. It was all good, clean fun. Charlie Sage's overriding ambition to sleep with his wife never explicitly referred to, even as he tried to explain to his superior officer why he desperately needed some compassionate leave. Please, listen, sir. Well, come on then. Sharp, sharp. I'm already married, sir. Oh, and stringing along with another girl. No, no, sir, I, I am married, sir, but I'm not married, sir, if you know what I mean. Don't know. How can you be married and not married? Eh? Well, it's easy, sir, when you got called up on your wedding day. Oh, well, that's what I think I'm in the picture now, sir. Manoeuvres cancelled, huh? Well, it was all under the table, wasn't it, really? I mean, nature's always been nature. Shirley Eaton, who by 1964 was in Goldfinger, sprawled across James Bond's bed covered in gold paint. But back in 1958, she played the coy newlywed who'd smuggled herself onto camp. Oh, but darling, how on earth did you get here? Never mind how I got here. I'm here. And tonight's our wedding night. You don't mean... Darling. You don't think I came here just to become a nappy girl? I think psychologically it was very bad to be so repressed, but that was the time. The lower class and the middle class were very prim people. I was brought up in that era. I had to, even though I was working and everything else, I had to be in by nine o'clock at night because I'm married from home at 20. I mean, it was very strict. Of course, for many of the cast, their normal lives too had been interrupted by national service. Kenneth Williams later recalled how he, like so many of his contemporaries, had tried that old trick of feigning sickness. But eventually I got into the doctor and he said, yes, all right, this boy obviously needs sedation. This is, this is a question of heat. It's probably a heat stroke, minor heat stroke he's having. And I was put into sick bay and put in bed. Well, I know thermometer, put in my mouth, temperature taken, <laughs> special diet, and goodness knows what. Others that were in there eventually, I found out, were doing just as much malingering as I was. Uh, but I thought I'm onto a very good thing here. But up on screen, Hattie Jakes playing medical officer Captain Clark was more than a match for any malingering soldier. Not today. You're all right. But, but doctor, I can feel a, a definite thump. Regularly, a boom, 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 boom. That, that's it. Yes. Strong, that's your heart beating normally. Cleared for duty, the National Serviceman's lot comprised endless drilling and discipline, excepting, of course, Private Go Lightly, played by the inimitable Charles Hawtrey. Now, you lads are in uniform for the first time, and I think you'll all agree with me that you don't yet look like soldiers. It would be stupid of me to expect that. It would that. He's very fair. That man there! Private Golightly, someone should have told you. You're not to talk when you're on parade. It's not the custom. So don't do it. Understand? Oh, yes, I understand. Right. Now, where was I? What was I saying? How stupid you are. One of their march pasts was da 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 bum bum that one, and that was the only thing I really enjoyed about it all: the marching, because there was rhythm, there was music, and we weren't allowed to sing. We sang outrageous versions of songs. You know, it was instead of "Long Way to Tipperary," it was "A Long Way to Tickle Mary," which I thought was terribly bold. <laughs> Scriptwriter Norman Hoodis scoffs at any notion that he was trying to make a sociological point. He was merely drawing on his own wartime experience in the RAF to pull together a plot line which would become familiar in the early carry-ons. A ragbag of people thrown together but coming out on top in the end. For the most part, it was earnest people in circumstances where they were being tried or pushed to the limit almost giving in, but eventually and surprisingly, if possible, coming through and doing what they're supposed to do and doing it well, then modestly walking away from it. And this happened uh, exemplified in Sargent. That's what it was about, coming through in the end, which 
is the story of Britain, particularly of recent memory of World War II. I never thought it at the time that we would ever lose. Never crossed my mind. But I also knew we were 21 miles English Channel from a concentration camp being set up on the Isle of Wight and me finishing up as a pile of ashes. But we came through. The time of war itself, and indeed the 10 or 15 years after the war, were about the subjugation of the individual to the interests of the state. The journalist and writer Simon Heffer has no doubt what the early carry-on films managed to achieve. There's a great sense in the carry-on films, but certainly I think for the, the first 10 years of their existence, that it's about people who are all in it together. There's that sense of social cohesion which was very important before an age when individualism became as highly prized as it is now. And I think that was the predominant, if you like, sociological current. And the films very accurately, I think, reflect that. Box office success for Carry On Sergeant meant a follow-up was quickly requested. Once again, community spirit, a bunch of misfits thrown together and a national institution, this time the NHS, provided the basic narrative shape for the second Carry On movie, Nurse, based on a men's surgical ward. And writing the screenplay, Norman Hoodis again drew on personal experience. Nature took a hand and threw me into the Watford Peace Memorial Hospital with an exploding appendix. So I had ten days free research into what it's really like, which is horny men and lovely girls all in a room together, the one helpless against the other. Let me warn you, hospitals have a strange effect on most men. They imagine, well, they think they're in love with the nurses. It happens every week to every nurse. I don't think it's imagination. You do. Shirley Eaton again, this time fighting off an amorous patient. Former nurse Dr Julia Hallam, now a film lecturer at Liverpool University, has examined the post-war image of the nursing profession in Britain. By 1959, when Carry On Nurse came out, the NHS was just over a decade old and films like it provide a patient's eye insight, she feels, into what was really going on. One of the things that you can think of them as representing is the first wave of consumer critique of the health service, particularly in hospitals, which were very authoritarian. Okay, what? What, what? Well, you can't sleep in those. That's quite all right. I can uh, take them off. With one hand? Yeah, yeah, I can manage. Thank you. Uh, You two ladies, just turn your backs, please. Be good. Wait a minute. Hey, what's going on? You can't... What a source! Nurse, please! What a fuss about such a little thing. Patients, I think, often felt too terrified to ask questions of people. They felt the hospital was a very demeaning process and it robbed you of your identity. And from the patient's point of view, you can see that the carry-ons are a bit of a rebellion against that idea. Feudal, that's what this place is, feudal. I could choke. I'm studying nuclear physics, the thing of the future. I've got an examination to pass, and I'm delayed because a survival from the surgical stone age called a matron is going to walk through here. I could spit, I could scream. Patty Jakes is a representation of an authoritarian woman, a woman in power, who is also very sexually frustrated. I think her portrayal is the cruelest of all in that film because she marches onto the wards and is seen as obsessed with tidiness and petty detail. What is the point, Mr Rickett? Why must I endure the extra pain of getting into and out of bed when I can rest just as effectively lying on top of the bedclothes? I don't like to see men lying about. It makes the ward look untidy. Matron's appearance would set patients and staff alike quaking. In the film, vividly portrayed by accident-prone junior nurse Dawson, played by Joan Sims. Nurse Dawson, how dare you burst in like that? Oh, just a minute. Ruddy thing. It's Matron's round. Well, mine's a pipe. <laughs> Julia Hallam says the film demonstrates the strict pecking order within the nursing profession of the 50s. Well, in Carry On Nurse, I think the hierarchy is very marked. Sister? I'm not a sister, I'm a staff nurse. Uh How do I tell the difference? Student nurses wear big hats, we call them butterflies. You call them what? Butterflies. I like that. They don't. And staff nurses wear these. Got it? Yes. I think you're wonderful. Relax, Mr York. It's also a class hierarchy. We've got Joan Sims as the entry nurse, who's obviously a bit dopey. 
but she's also a working class girl the middle class girls are the kind of staff nurses and the trained nurses very professional um, never get ruffled even when Joan Sims manages to completely flood the sluice by trying to wash a bedpan in the way that you should wash a bottle and carry on nurses full of those sort of silly errors that Joan Sims keeps making uh, Just a minute Mr York Hello, what's that? Uh, for your bowels, sit down please You um, given one of these before? Oh, good gracious. Hundreds. <laughs> Get it down now. Other end, nurse. Never mind. With a face like mine, it's a mistake anyone might make. For writer Norman Hoodis, there was one vital research tool he relied upon. His wife, Rita, had been a nurse herself. Most of the stuff in Carry On Nurse was real because when Norman was writing up in his den he used to yell out Rita what happened next what happened when the nurses were boiling the gloves and she forgot about them and they burnt and there was a stink all over the hospital oh what a stink the cook appears to be improving sister investigate that odor yes certainly matron <laughs> you idiot oh oh I'm, I'm so sorry sister you really are a complete fool aren't you and it was Rita's mother who gave Hooders the idea for the final scene in which an awkward patient is taught an embarrassing lesson. Two nurses come in and say, well, Colonel, one more test. Turn over on your tummy, please. And we cut to the door, and the two nurses are aghast. They've got a camera up to take a picture of him, but the matron is marching along at this point. They vanish. In steps Hattie Jakes. Colonel, whatever's going on? Come, come, matron. Sure you've seen a temperature taken like this before? <laughs> Yes, Colonel, many times, but never with a daffodil. Norman Hoodis may have allowed his imagination to run riot, but in other ways too, Julia Hallam argues, the film slipped into the realms of fantasy when it came to portraying the real makeup of Britain at the time. By that time, there would have been nurses in training to be state-enrolled nurses who would have been coming from the Caribbean and they would have also been working as auxiliary nurses. And many people from the Commonwealth would have been working as cleaners on the wards. So it's very unrealistic in terms of the actual makeup of the people that constitute the hospital staff. And that also applies to the doctors, of course, because by the post-war period... We were already employing doctors, particularly from India. Simon Heffer agrees. We were a nation of bigots in those days, let's be quite frank about it. I don't think that in the 1960s, if you had put black people in a film in that way, it would have been very commercially successful. I think people didn't understand or think that that was what their country looked like. I think now if you made a film about the health service putting black people in, you'd just be insane. But Carry On Teacher, released later in 1959, did, however, clearly reflect what was one of the hot topics within the profession at the time, whether or not to continue with corporal punishment. Sir, there's only one thing to do to save yourself. Whack! Extraordinary theory. You bend a trial double in order to give it an upright character. It wasn't until 1986 that corporal punishment was outlawed in state schools. The argument between Hattie Jakes and Kenneth Williams reflected a long-running divide between those who considered caning cruel and those who felt it was character-building. In between the corny jokes and the slapstick, Carry On Teacher also touched on the emerging debate about progressive teaching methods versus the traditional approach. Hear the alarm when the staff are told that a trendy child psychologist, Alistair Grigg, played by Leslie Phillips, is about to take part in the next school inspection. He must not come here. That Grigg, he's a lunatic. I read one of his books once, Free Expression. You know what that means. Sex in the cycle shed. Really? How disgusting. Now in his early 80s, Fred Jarvis joined the National Union of Teachers in 1955 and became its general secretary 20 years later. There was always a lot of scepticism about people like the guy in that film. Most teachers were resistant to the idea that this is the way you treat kids, which that film does reflect in its attitude to the psychiatrist. Because Alistair Griggs has a book yeah. called The Child is Always Right, That's which right. Yeah, one yeah. of the, the other teachers the, calls yeah, treacherous yeah, yeah. trial. And, and, of course, in the film, the, some of the teachers were scathing 
in, in that situation. Do you think I, a working teacher, could give my heart to the author of this treacherous tripe, this stab in the back to the entire profession? How dare you? I studied in Vienna. And I teach here. This is all mushy theory. I know children. You know? What do you know? You know, it's easier to stand in the path of progress and meet new ideas halfway. God, you're talking just like an ignorant Victorian muscle-bound governor. I'd rather be that than a namby-pamby starry-eyed head-shrinking twerp. Oh, you listen to me. But, as became the norm, the producers didn't allow any serious message about the debate going on at the time to interfere with the usual torrent of innuendo-laden lines that came as fast as a swishing cane. Who's that? Miss Alcock. Miss Alcock. Ding dong. Are you satisfied with your equipment, Miss Alcock? Well, I've had no complaints so far. (laughs) Oh, uh, equipment. Yes, yes, I have everything I need, thank you. At this point, let us speed you on to 1963 and carry on cabby, where a particular piece of physical equipment plays a vital role. May I see your legs, please? Right, you've got the job. Next, please, Joe. By now, under the pen of Talbot Rothwell, the carry-ons moved on to new territory, the Battle of the Sexes. Carry-on cabby is certainly, I think, what Jermaine Greer would call a proto-feminist film. In brief, Hattie Jakes, fed up with her taxi company-owning husband Sid James being all work and no play, decides to take him on at his own game by forming an all-female alternative, Glam Cabs. Right, girls. This is it. I want you to get out there and grab all the business from under their smug male noses. I don't care how you do it. Within reason, just get the fares in your cabs. (laughs) In the back of the cab, dear, with you in the front. Any questions? Well, actually, darling, do you think we really stand a chance? I mean, there are far more men drivers, actually. I know, but the men haven't got your advantages, dear. Just flash your headlamps at them. Not exactly hardline feminism, but according to Andy Medhurst and Simon Heffer, a pretty accurate description of attitudes at the time. It shows women using their sexuality to sort of outwit men. You have people like Amanda Barry playing a very attractive young female taxi driver using her sexual allure to reel men in and show them for the kind of idiots that the film seems to suggest that they are. I say, you'll never guess what I've just seen. A smashing bit of overtime driving a cab. It is certainly something that shows that by, I think it was 1963 that was made, women were no longer assumed just to be homemakers and to be waiting for the return of their husband with his dinner in the oven and his slippers by the fire. And, again, that's a very accurate reflection of society. I'm actually a bit of overtime driving a cab. But it was a brunette, and she was covered all over with legs and things. Don't be filthy. <laughs> Pie pot, please. Birds don't drive cabs. They can't. They haven't got... A... That's her. Excuse me, this is a cab driver's cafe, isn't it? That's right. Oh, jolly good. Well, well, I'd like... Oh, no, what was it? Oh, yes, um, a cup of char and a wad. Any of your chaps free? Oh, yes, I am, darling. I say. We're talking the first half of the 1960s, which is a period when rapid social change is about to happen. It's around the period of the first Beatles record, so clearly something very big is shifting, but it hasn't quite begun yet, and Carry On Cabby looks at a transitional period. I mean, Sid James is a 1950s man and Hattie Jakes is aspiring to be a 1960s woman. But because it's still the first chunk of the 60s, the opportunities are relatively limited. It was in those early 60s that the carry-ons, for the first time, moved away from contemporary settings, perhaps to give their viewers a break from the harsh realities of life. They took refuge in spoofs, historical settings like Julius Caesar's Rome in Carry On Cleo. Infamy! Infamy! They've all got it in for me! Ah! Or the 1966 Carry On Screaming, in which the team play Hammer Horror for laughs. What must you think of me? I'm such a terrible hostess, I haven't offered you a thing. I wouldn't say that, miss. Do you drink? Not on duty, miss. Do you smoke? Not on duty, miss. Well, do you mind if I smoke? No, of course not, miss. Thank you so much. 
I'm just sat there, and clouds of smoke came from behind the sofa and round my legs and everywhere. And that was the end of the scene. And I do remember saying to Jerry Thomas, Oh, Jerry, do I really have to say this corny gag, you know? And he said, Don't worry about it, darling. Children will love it. <laughs> And, of course, they do. I mean, tiny children, as long as they can walk, come up to me in the street and say, do you mind if I smoke? And then shriek with laughter. Fenella Fielding played scarlet-clad villainess Valeria Watt. She recalls that director Gerald Thomas lived up to his reputation for turning out his movies at high speed and on low budgets. Certainly in Carry On Screaming... There was one scene where I did ask for a retake and I explained to Jerry why I thought it was a good idea and fortunately he thought so too, you know. But later on in the same film, I thought, well, I'll ask him again, you know, perhaps we could have done it better or something. And he said, ah, no, he said, you've had your retake. (laughs) That really meant, like, for the rest of your life. She'd had a similar experience when playing a small role in Carry On Regardless five years earlier as... Penny Panting. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Yes, Penny Panting. Both films relied on that Carry On staple, innuendo, giving the censors and the critics much to chew over. Well, Felix Barker, speaking of that particular scene, wrote that Miss Fielding, you know, he didn't call me my full name, he gave me the dignity of calling me Miss Fielding, was obliged to perform a scene of prolonged indecency. And I thought, well... I don't think it was as bad as all that. But he expressed the hope that I would never be asked to do a scene like that again. What's more, she told me she hadn't discovered what all the fuss was about until much later. It's all what you understand, isn't it, at different times in your life. And when I was doing Carry On Screaming, whistle didn't mean a phallic object to me. But it obviously did to this sort of egghead who was sort of earnestly looking for all this, you know, when he went through it. By 1968 and Carry On Up the Khyber, the winds of change are beginning to blow. How could you whittle? I felt the cold, sir. That's no excuse, man. The third foot and mouth never wear anything under the kilt. It's part of our glorious tradition. Look at our motto. Always ready for action. The writer and social commentator Toby Young salutes the Carry On team's endless ingenuity when it came to euphemisms. Carry On films belong to a particular era in British post-war history when certain things could not be referred to directly, but only obliquely. So, for instance, it was okay to allude to anal intercourse in a film like Carry On Up the Khyber, which, after all, is Cockney rhyming slang, Kyber Pass Arse, except you couldn't actually ever say the word arse. Private Widow, I know you're an ignorant nana, but when you are ordered to attention, you are courteously requested to stop shuffling your flaming feet about! I was only trying to keep warm. Oh, so you're cold, are you? Perishing. The way the wind whistles up the pass... The film had a certain poignancy for its audience who'd watched over the past two decades as the sun set on Britain's dominance of the world map. Simon Heffer. It's at a time when Britain has lost its empire and is just beginning to come to terms with the fact that it did. This was made 20 years after India became independent and it shows that it's no longer a subject for misery or embarrassment or a sense of national shame. We can all remember that it was actually all quite a bit of a laugh and we can look at it for comic purposes. Oh, they come out here with their starched uniforms and their stiff upper lips and their dirty great flags hanging out. Think they own the place. They do. It represents as far as you could go 
in having jokes or tackling taboos while still remaining funny. I mean, the fact that the main Indian in there is called the Kazi of Calabar brings in that whole theme that runs through so many carry-on films about lavatories. The British love laughing at lavatories. They're incredibly funny. You've got Sid James having tiffin with various beautiful native ladies every afternoon. Down this nervous, please. We're going to have a bit of tiffin. Which is a synonym for a bit of slap and tickle. And... I think it's very much redolent of what, if we can dare to use such a phrase now, was the national sense of humour at the time. And I'm impressed, actually, that now, when these films are put on television, a lot of people still watch them and still find them funny and see something that's still definitively British there. And though it was supposed to offer its audience an escape from modern Britain, Sir Christopher Frayling admires the way that the scriptwriters couldn't resist the odd contemporary reference. There's a very interesting moment in Carry On at the Khyber where Bernard Breslau, who's this outrageous stereotype of, in quotes, native leader, called Bungdit in, of course, (laughs) says... That will teach them to bend turbans on the buses. (laughs) And you think, hang on, there's something in the news about Sikhs, about turbans, about buses. Every now and again you get a moment which reminds you of what the headlines were. There's the other scene, isn't there, where Kenneth Williams, who is playing the Kazi of Calabar, <laughs> says that they're going to uh, kill the British troops. And he said... They will die the death of a thousand cats. Oh, no. Oh, that's horrible. Nonsense, child. The British are used to cats. Exactly. Exactly, you see. And in the audience, everyone would know because of the, the cuts in public services. And Sid James watching a polo game. Later. Well played, Philip! You'll go far there, boy, if he makes the right marriage. It's full of things like that. Do you think you can tell much about what a culture thinks of itself by what it laughs <laughs> at? I do, and I think the carry-on films are a reminder that there's been all this emphasis on the swinging 60s and what was going on in London, in particular around Carnaby Street and Chelsea, Kings Road, and we forget that outside London, not much of that was going on. This is out-of-London humour. This is the other story that was going on in the 60s. You look at photographs of the mid-60s, and they're like Coketown in the 1940s. They're like picture-post photographic essays. Not that much has changed. Women in headscarves, old-fashioned prams, back-to-back houses being knocked down to make way for the wonderful new high-rises we all thought, and everything covered in grime. It's a different world outside London, and I think Carry On reminds us that there's this other England. He feels the moment when the old and the new come to blows is most vividly captured in Carry On Camping in 1969. It is the great anti-1960s movie. It doesn't like psychedelia, it doesn't like recreational drugs, it doesn't like all these dolly birds sleeping around. It's the old guard reacting against that. I just wanted to warn you. I don't want to hear of any unnecessariness when my Joan gets back. Unnecessariness? You know what I mean. What makes you think that's unnecessary? (laughs) We quite like repression. It affects our rather conservative view of the world. That, in the end, we believe in marriage. But you stick to your own tents, that's all. Oh, Mum, really? It's not as if she'd got a ring on her finger, you know. She hasn't got one through her nose, either. In Carry On Camping, older henpecked Sid James is fed up when the schoolgirl he's been ogling, Barbara Windsor, becomes bedazzled by the hippie encampment in the next field. There's a kind of edge to it, which is in the next door field to the carry on field, something's going on that we don't like very much. We don't like the direction it's going in and we feel it a bit threatening. So, yeah, it really feels like the old guard 11 versus the hippie 11. And the old guard, of course, win. But while Sid and Co may have managed to rein in the marauding hippies, something else was about to burst free from its constraints, marking another famous threshold in the carry ons. And up! And down. There is that moment in the middle of it, which is a, a PT demonstration with Barbara Windsor where her bra flies off, which was a first in Carry On. I really touch those toes, Barbara. That and is in the top ten, that scene, and of the most shown all round the world. Arms flinging from side to side, begin. And fling and in. And fling and in. And both arms fling. Now really, let's see those chests come out. Suddenly dawned on me I was going to lose my bra. It didn't read like that in the script at all. And flew. <laughs> 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 
Off camera, armed with a fishing rod, an elderly prop man had the task of reeling in said bra at the required moment. The first time they went to pull it off, because I said, that doesn't happen. A bra would go straight down. It doesn't fly off. They come out with all these ideas. And the first one, it didn't. So I got dragged into the mud and it was pick her up, mop her down and go again. And it was, don't show your boobs, because we had the great... John Trevelyan, you know, he was the old censor. censor. So the second time, I did it, perfect, and then Hattie went and pulled my arm, so I flashed the right boob. Oh, we'll go again. Never did more than two takes. Oh, now we're on three takes, so they want to know now. They're screaming at me. So the third take, got it all perfect. And then when they submitted it to the Trevelyan, he said, I don't think Miss Windsor's right boob will corrupt the nation, and he passed it. After that, carry-on couldn't work, really. Because it depends on repression. It depends on actually not having nudity, not being explicit, and seeing everything as a bit suggestive. Had the camera lingered for longer on her breasts, it might have fatally destroyed her status as a sort of female sex symbol. Because actually, if you freeze frame it, which you know men of my generation did back in their teens when video recorders first appeared, her breasts turned out to be extremely small. In 1968, Barbara Windsor in Carry On Doctor had, of course, been setting pulses racing as mini-skirted Nurse May. Good evening. Oh, hi. Oh, what a lovely-looking pair. You took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasing to Toby Young's freeze-frame generation, and their dads, perhaps, but a far cry from the sedate, professional, skirt-on-the-knee nurses of Carry On Nurse of nearly a decade earlier. And according to film academic and former nurse Julia Hallam, Nurse May didn't go down at all well with the real professionals. She reflects the breakdown of discipline, I think, occurring within the nursing hierarchy itself as more and more girls from working class backgrounds come into nursing. So also the old ways get more and more challenged by them. So she represents a force for anarchy within this very tight profession. She's the kind of disruptive element because she's too sexy. And she certainly made an impact on Sid James's blood pressure. I'm Nurse May. I was told to report here, sister. I'll be with you in a moment. Hi. Barbara Windsor walked on, you know, flanking her sexuality. The profession found it horrific. Oh. They really were worried about it because to show women nurses as sexualized was something that the profession worked very hard against. For them, it was the big taboo because they're doing things which are extremely personal to people. The attitude towards them is best summed up really by an image on the front of the nursing mirror that came out around the millennium time, 1999-2000. And it was actually a picture of Nurse May being put in the dustbin and there was a big headline saying, this image is gone forever. While nurses felt insulted by Barbara Windsor's characterisation of them, union shop stewards were about to get their share of the carry-on treatment. All right, everyone, you all heard it. Direct aggravation of a genuine grievance. Stop work. Everybody out! Carry On at Your Convenience came out in 1971, the year that a new Industrial Relations Act was passed aiming to reduce the number of unofficial strikes. The year before had proved to be the worst in terms of days lost in industrial disputes since 1926, so the Heath government thought it was on to a good thing. So did the Carry On producers when they decided to lampoon the shop steward, Vic Spanner, at W.C. Boggs Toilet Manufacturers. If a tap fitter does it, that means he's doing a waste pipe fitter's job. If a waste pipe fitter does it, that means he's doing a tap fitter's job. Well, what the hell does it matter as long as they're both working? That's what I was saying. If you'll pardon me, you don't have a say. This is union business. Well, it is our union, isn't it? Exactly. And for that reason, you'll do as I bloody told you. As Andy Medhurst from Sussex University points out, the film producers might easily have assumed that the stereotype would bring a smile to audiences who were living through the industrial strife of the early 70s. Trade unions become portrayed in that film as obsessed with the sort of minutiae of rules and regulations. They become one of those repressive institutions in this film, which the carry-ons have always been keen to challenge. 
But in fact, by 1971, public appreciation of unions was high and growing, and the unusually negative reaction to carry on at your convenience showed that in this respect, the producers had read their working class audience wrong. It would have been full of union members. If people are in unions, and at the time of those films, 11, 12 million in those days, would have direct experience of a union situation and union activity. And I don't think they would take kindly to their portrayal of the union rep as A, a tyrant, B, an idiot. Former NUT General Secretary Fred Jarvis says it's clear why this film did surprisingly poor business at the box office. That would not tally with their everyday experience because on the whole the role of stewards in their view would be much more positive and sensible and the number of times you get people to strike at the drop of a hat were absolutely rare. I was still at primary school when Carry On At Your Convenience came out, so union business and the like went over my head. But holidays, now you're talking. I hear you're going on your holiday tomorrow, then. Yeah, yeah, just a weekend, that's all. All right, for some. You taking the missus, too? No, she won't go abroad. My dad had driven us through France and Spain with a trailer tent on the back of the car. I remember it was a rare thing to spot another British number plate. So the idea of getting on a plane and flying to a hotel in Spain... That was exotic. One of new package deals, 17 quid all in. Simon Heffer recalls the impact that the first package holidays had as portrayed in Carry On Abroad in 1972. It was about this new shared experience of going to foreign climes. It's a place called Els Bells. <laughs> By the late 1960s, there were still very few people who had been abroad for any purpose other than to kill foreigners on behalf of the Queen in her army. So to go to Spain and to get sunburned and to be in a hotel full of people taking their clothes off was probably quite a shock and it does seem to be an entirely accurate representation and it's a way that these films show how things did change. Signed up to play Kenneth Connor's bossy wife Evelyn, June Whitfield looked forward to getting away from Britain. When I was asked to do Carry On Abroad, I thought, oh, that'll be fun, I wonder where we're going. Where did we go? The car park at Pinewood. Carry On Abroad, as ever, was made on a shoestring, truckloads of sand being brought in to make the Pinewood backlot look like a beach. At least in the film, the cast did go to Spain, chaperoned by tour guide Stuart Farquhar, played by Kenneth Williams. Ah, oh, Miss Dickie and Miss Mays, thank you. May I wish you both an extremely happy holiday? Oh, thanks. Come on, Marge. But if, like me, you remember news reports of the time, you'll recall that in some holiday areas, package tours had taken off so rapidly that people might arrive and find their hotel either wasn't built or not quite in the dream state they'd imagined. And this hotel doesn't seem to be quite finished. Not finished? Oh, it's nothing. A little bit of building to finish. Four or five floors, maybe that's so. Four or five floors? You have got room for us, though. Valère Jolly, who now works in the sustainable tourism industry, was a tour guide in the early 70s. Overbooking was rife. When I was a young guide, for instance, I would start off often with an overbooking situation of maybe 30 people or so. You'd trail around from one hotel to the next hotel to the one, and eventually you'd get rid of all of the people by about 10 o'clock at night and they would, they'd have somewhere to stay. The problem, he explains, was that the package tour for Brits proved such a money spinner that many holiday locations wanted a slice of the action, ready or not. Countries that didn't have a lot of money, I mean, for instance, Spain, and after the war, you know, it was quite difficult for them, saw that the tourism business presented a really good opportunity for them to develop. And this is the reason why, you know, our carry-on abroad people went to a hotel that was half built because basically hoteliers could get free money they could borrow as much money as they wanted to build hotels and the whole of the cost of was like a building site and then of course there was that funny foreign food now don't forget used to steer none of that oily food and take your syrup figs regularly every night yes mommy but do stop worrying i should be quite all right oh i do hope so dear but I should be praying to him every night to keep your bowels open. Were those early British visitors able to break free from obsessing about their bowels? Were they culture vultures eager to set off and learn about a foreign country and its customs, even its language? You must be joking. Very, very, very few people from this country were interested in the same way that they are now in local cuisine or the language. I mean, you know, the best British attitude to 
foreigners in their home countries is to speak a little bit louder and if that doesn't work speak rather more loudly and i mean that's one of the great cultural things has changed but Valère Jolly notes that Carry On Abroad got it right, showing that then and now, package holidays offered a once-a-year opportunity to shed those inhibitions. I remember that at the time there was a holiday company that was set up, it's called 4S Travel. Now, 4S was actually the name of the people that founded it. But of course, we all knew what 4S actually meant. Sun, sea, sand and whatever the other S is, I can't remember. The idea that you could go abroad and have an exotic experience in more ways than one was something that you clearly see from the carry-on film, that that's what people were expecting. It took June Whitfield's character a little more time than most to loosen up. As we watched the film together, she recalled her favourite scene. Would you like a drink? No, thank you. I tried it once and didn't like it. No, I tried it once and didn't like it. Oh. Have a smoke? I tried it once and didn't like it. Great. Not at all. My daughter is just the same. Your only child, I presume. <laughs> <laughs> Your only daughter, I presume. <laughs> Great. That was the humour of the carry-ons. But eventually the son and the local vino even got to her, as Andy Medhurst recalls. Yeah, June Whitfield is playing the June Whitfield character, the respectable suburban housewife. And then the son and possibly the sangria get to her as well, and she starts losing her metaphorical corsets. It's the idea that back home in grey, rainy England, people wouldn't indulge in these pleasures of the flesh, but possibly when you get to a foreign climate, the things can change. Her resolve crumbles just as, in the film's finale, the Palace Hotel collapses around them. Oh, do hurry up, darling. Coming! <laughs> he sort of leapt on the bed and we went through the floor. And thank God we only had to do it once. That would have been a bit worrying. Because he dropped down several floors, I think. Yeah, and the whole bed dropped through. He might not be allowed to do it now, you know, elf and safety. June Whitfield showing a disregard for health and safety restrictions. But in Carry On Girls, it was she who was portrayed as the ultimate killjoy, Augusta Prodworthy, women's libber, out to stop a beauty contest being staged in her seaside town of Furcom. Mr Mayor, you are well aware of my views on women's rights and there can never be anything proper in young women being shown off like cattle for the sexual gratification of a lot of drooling men. Whereas in Carry On Cabby, Hattie Jakes and her Glam Cabs team were celebrated for taking on the men, Carry On Girls in 1973 demonstrated a far less indulgent attitude towards women's liberation. Dr Julia Hallam believes the Carry Ons were tapping into their traditional audience's suspicions. The feminists who start the fun in Carry On Girls are just dismissed as a kind of disruptive force which just has to be contained because within the greater scheme of things, women have very little importance in the Carry On world. They're just there to have a laugh with, perform their sexual functions, but it's very much what we would see today as a kind of lad world. You can see where the Carry Ons got their plot lines from. The 1970 Miss World contest at the Royal Albert Hall had been interrupted by feminists who'd pelted the stage with fruit and flower bombs. And in 1971, there'd been the UK's biggest ever women's lib demo in Hyde Park. Two years later, when the publishing house Virago was launched, suspicion and ridicule of feminists were rife. Now take this gentleman here. He can dress up as a woman if he so wishes. She is a woman. Augusta Prodworthy's assistant, of course, cast as a butch, suit-wearing man-hater. I wondered if June Whitfield had any sympathy with the character she'd played. Was she a women's libber back then? No. Good God, no. I think I've always felt fairly liberated anyway. I didn't really feel I had to go about burning a bra or something. <laughs> but in the film, the way that people joined your women's lib group was that they burnt their bra over a, a candle. A big bra burning scene. I, Mildred Bumble. I, Mildred Bumble. Publicly proclaim my equality to man. Publicly proclaim my equality to man. And hereby cast aside the bonds of womanhood. And hereby cast aside the bonds of womanhood. What about those real attempts to disrupt beauty contests in the early 70s, which were echoed in the closing scenes of Carry On Girls? June Whitfield says she personally had little time for it. They went for years with nobody saying a word. How lovely that 
our Angie is up there becoming Miss World or something. Everybody thought it was great fun. And then suddenly it was, oh, no, parading undressed women in front of people. I mean, who do they think they are, for heaven's sake? It's true that for all those who found books like Jermaine Greer's 1970 bestseller The Female Eunuch inspiring, there were plenty of others who found its ideas threatening. And it was this particular audience that the Carrions had in mind. They reflect prevailing attitudes of the time, but they always do so within quite a regressive or backward-looking mould. They wouldn't ever take on the role of wanting to be anything other than critical of these sorts of modernising changes in society. The carry-on films were about Britain at a very particular point in time, and in a way they try to hold it there. Yearning for a bygone age their audiences may have been, but the carry-on producers made a stab at keeping up with the permissive society. However, by the mid-70s, soft porn was readily available to cinema audiences. Films like Confessions of a Window Cleaner and Emmanuel. And as Sir Christopher Frayling observes, the carry-on's mildly risque humour just couldn't compete. Because most of the comedy depended on repression and suggestiveness and nudge-nudge and not quite saying it directly, when, in quotes, permissiveness starts happening, it's dead. I mean, where's the basis of the humour if Barbara Windsor can take her clothes off and say what she likes? It's not funny. You can't say core and stop messing about and charming and ding-dong anymore. You look like a sort of elderly lech which some of them did, by the way, towards the end in something like Carry On Emmanuel, which actually tried to survive in that new world, and it's a complete disaster. By 1978, Carry On Emmanuel proved a lacklustre attempt to spoof the soft porn genre, with its central character afforded several opportunities to appear in public without her clothes. Sacre bleu! I forgot I wasn't wearing a dress. You're a naughty butler, Lorenz. As the film opens, Emmanuel is seducing a fellow passenger on board Concord. A far cry from the cheeky suggestiveness of the earlier films. I dreamt about you last night, nurse. Did you? No, you wouldn't let me. Barbara Windsor knew it wasn't a project she'd want to be associated with. I remember getting the script for Emmanuel and I sat and wept. Wet buckets because the opening scene was so vulgar and nasty and I put my hands up, I said, well, I love Carry On Dick. Sid has died. Bernie phoned me up and he went, oh, Barbara, and we went, thank you, we we thank you very much, because we all had our other careers, you know, and that was it, and it ended sad. In fact, the carry-ons didn't end in Emmanuel. In 1992, there was an attempt to revive the franchise with Carry On Columbus, using alternative comics like Rick Mayle and Julian Clary. Most of the regulars had by now passed away. June Whitfield starred as the Queen of Spain. So many of the original characters were missing. Maybe you couldn't do the carry-ons without that particular group of Kenneth Williams, Sid James, Hattie Jakes, Barbara, Ken Connor and Bernard Breslau, they were so much a part of it and associated with it. When none of them were there, they thought, well, this isn't to carry on. Toby Young agrees, and he points up another problem with trying to update the films. Their humour was just too warm-hearted and affectionate. One of the hallmarks of the carry-on films is that they were completely inclusive. They weren't at all elitist. They were on the side of the little guy. It's him against the world. And in this respect, carry-on films are very different to a lot of contemporary comedy, like Little Britain, Catherine Tate Show, The Royal Family, in which often the targets of the humour are the least well-off, the least well-educated members of our society. You know, in effect, they're afflicting the afflicted and comforting the comfortable. So what about the constant speculation that a new carry-on film's in the offing? Toby Young feels it would be a mistake because the original series was so much of its time. The general attitude that emerges from the films is one of good-humoured tolerance for the fact that nothing really works, that the governing classes are hopeless. And I think that reflected a fundamental deference. You know, I think the attitude was, 
we can point out these mistakes and we can point out the shortcomings of these institutions and of the post-war British state because ultimately we have confidence in the ruling class that they're going to do a good job. I think one of the reasons you couldn't make carry-on films today is that confidence is gone, that deference is gone. Today, people are no longer good-humoured about the fact that things don't really work. That's a source of barely contained volcanic rage. In Barbara Windsor's view, modern audiences have moved on from associating themselves with the stereotypes portrayed in the films. Their popularity, she says, is really rooted in the naughty but nice seaside postcard humour, loaded with double entendres and recognisable characters from the era. If you'd have gone down Blackpool, you'd have seen all those characters. I can remember walking down Blackpool Pier and stopping and laughing. There was the fat woman sitting with her legs open. There was the lech, Sid James. There was the gay mincing down and thinking that blonde, more blondes look like me than I, you know, any, any of so them. It was very much of that time, so let's leave it, you know. Leave well alone, she advises, and many will agree they'd rather wallow in the film's nostalgia. Dismissed. Carry on, Sergeant. The critics might have been snooty about them, their audiences considered unsophisticated, the plot lines unsubtle, but Peter Rogers and his team never claimed to be providing high art. Now, as the 50th anniversary approaches, the films will carry on playing as if by loop on TV channels here and worldwide. They'll carry on providing that wet Sunday afternoon giggle, the moment when all the family can get together. And they'll carry on reminding us how much society and attitudes have changed since 1958. Will we ever see their like again? Not bloody likely! (laughs) 